All right. So I'm just waiting to admit a few more people and then we will get going. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are the Marine Environmental Education Center um, at the Carpenter House. If you guys have not heard of us, we are a joint partnership between Broward County Parks and Nova Southeastern University. My name is Carly. I am the education coordinator here at the Meek. Um, my picture is very dark, but you don't really need to see me because we're going to be learning today. Um, if you guys have any questions, please just type it in the chat and I promise I will get to it. Uh, so for this one, we are going to be talking about lionfish. So they are an invasive species. Um, so I'll do a quick, I have a little PowerPoint to show you guys um, just to kind of talk about some of their characteristics, um, why they're here, why they're so terrible for our reef here in Florida. And then I will go into a dissection. Um, we usually work with school groups. So we usually have Broward County schools come to us for field trips, um, all about hands-on learning. So having the kids kind of do all the fun stuff and I just get to facilitate. Um, a little bit different now because of everything going on. Uh, so I'll be doing the dissection, not as fun, but you get to learn, which is fun as well. Um, so I think we're oh, ready to get started. You shouldn't have to admit them anymore. Sweet. Technology. I am learning Zoom. It's amazing. Uh, so let's see if I can share my screen and we'll roll from there. Woo, awesome. All right. <clears throat> nope, that's not it. Oh. Oh, it pops up. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah. This is recorded. This is not good. All right, you guys. So this is our lionfish uh, program. Oh, there we go. Savannah's here. We can start. Um, so lionfish, so anytime we talk about animals, we start really, really broad. And then we, uh, based on common characteristics, we get uh, more specified, specified, specified to a specific species. Um, so taxonomy. So whenever we start, one of the things that I like to start with is if, um, trying to figure out if the animal is a vertebrate or an invertebrate. So that just means, does it have a backbone? That's just a vertebrate. Or does it not have a backbone, which is an invertebrate? Um, so we are talking about fish, a, a type of fish today. So it is a vertebrate. We have five major groups of vertebrates. The first ones are fish, which we're talking about today. Then we have reptiles. We have amphibians. We have birds. Woohoo! And then we have mammals. Um, so once we have that, then we can kind of go from there. And again, just talking about common characteristics, we have three major groups or three classes of fish. We have the bony fish, which is has over 28,000 species. Then we have our cartilaginous fish. So think of your skates, rays, sharks, um, things like that. And then we have our jawless fish. So Agnantha, they're really weird looking things and uh, they are the most ancient out of all of them. But uh, we are focusing on our bony Thank fish today, so lionfish. Oh, if you guys have your microphone on, could you please just mute it? Unless you want to lead class, but then good luck. I'll have to read my slides. All right. So, like I said, they are an invasive species, um, but here are just some examples of invasive, native, and non-native species. Um, so native means it's from here. It's supposed to be here. It has a purpose in the ecosystem. Non-native means it's not from here. It got introduced, but it doesn't have an effect on the ecosystem. And then we have invasive, which means it is not from here. It got introduced and it actually has a negative impact on our ecosystem. So we'll just kind of go through the animals we have here. So on the top left, and I'm circling with my mouse if you can see, the top left we have a sea turtle and they are native to Florida. Uh, in the middle we have the Burmese python and they are invasive. So they are a huge problem in the Everglades. Um, they were introduced back in the 80s or 90s, I believe. Um, and they have caused quite an issue uh, in the Everglades. And we actually have some python hunts that happen here pretty regularly just to kind of limit that population because they just go, they eat everything. They're top predators there and nothing's keeping their population in check. On the top right, right here, this is a red-eared slider. You can see that red marking right there. Uh, if you guys have been to the meet, we have one of those. His name is Cashew. Um, so they are non-native. They don't have, they're not supposed to be here, but they don't have a negative impact on our environment. Uh, they were introduced through the pet trade. So a lot of times when people get turtles, they don't realize how long or how big they can grow to be. So uh, a lot of them got released here in Florida. And again, they're not having a negative impact on our ecosystem, but they're not supposed to be here. So Cashew is actually a conservation ambassador here. Um, he is just here to teach you guys how to be a responsible human and learning about native, non-native invasive. Now we're going to jump to the bottom left, our beautiful floating potato, what I like to call them. Uh, these are manatees, aka sea cows. They are native to Florida. We actually have the West Indian manatee here. Uh, in the middle is going to be a bottlenose dolphin, and they are native as well. And the bottom right, dun dun dun, put the Jaws theme song in the background, that is going to be the invasive lionfish. So they are invasive, they're not from here, they're not supposed to be here. 
Um, and it is having a negative impact on our ecosystem. So this just talks about non-native species. So they're not from here, but they don't have a negative impact versus the invasive species where they're not from here and they're having a huge negative impact on our environment. Um, so they can, the way that you tell the difference between non-native and native is that our, or sorry, excuse me, non-native and invasive, the invasive species, uh, they become established and they reproduce like crazy. And then they can have a negative impact on either native populations, like other things that they're competing with, or just like the entire ecosystem as a whole. So we're thinking of our reefs here. Um, they are the, one of the worst, well, let me minimize that. Uh, they are the worst marine invasion to date, um, and they are one of the first marine fish that became established in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so they are not from here. They are from the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so they, what's really unique about them is that they can be found in a variety of depths. So they can be found like a foot below or foot below the surface of the ocean, all the way down to a thousand feet below the surface. And they can inhabit different environments. So they can be in a hard bottom. They could be in mangroves, seagrass, coral, artificial reefs, kind of anywhere. So that's one of the things that makes them so terrible here because they don't really have many things limiting them. Um, they... We're brought here because they are they are beautiful. I'll even agree with that. So if you look at this photo right here on the top left, they are mesmerizing fish. So they're very popular in aquariums, um, especially home aquariums too. And one of the things about them is that they're very slow moving and conspicuous. So they like to hide, um, especially under rocks and ledges and corals. So right here, the distribution map. So this is where their native region is. Um, there are actually about 20 different species of lionfish uh, native in, or in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so the invasion happened here back in 1985. That was when the first one was spotted and actually right close to here, right off Dania Beach Pier, um, which if you guys have been to the meet, we are, we are right in between the Hollywood Broadwalk and the Dania Beach Pier. So it was first spotted right off the pier, right up the road. Um, and there are actually only two species that are responsible for the invasion here. If we were to look at the two species right next to each other, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So they, their external characteristics look identical. It's actually their DNA, which is where the difference, the difference is between the two species. So we have the red lionfish, which is actually about 93% of all the lionfish in the Western Hemisphere. And then we have the devil firefish. So that'll be the other 7%. Um, like I said, we actually can't tell the difference between them, just looking at them. And they were able to figure out that it was between five to seven breeding females in the Atlantic Ocean that actually started the invasion here. Um, they think there's a couple of theories for how um, the aquarium is one of the big ones. Uh, they think that is, oops, sorry, uh, they think that is kind of how it started, but they're not sure if it was people releasing them or if it was when one of the hurricanes came through um, and one aquarium that had them, if they just kind of got washed out and introduced into the ocean there. Uh, the crazy thing about them is that they've been found as far north as uh, New York, even Rhode Island, and now they're starting to make their way down south around South America. Um, so Brazil has had a couple of spottings as well, um, and that's something I'll kind of touch on in a moment. So this map, oh, well, sorry, let me backtrack. So like I said, uh, 20 different species. I only put uh, 16 on here because 20 made it not very pretty for the eyeball. Um, so these are what they can look like in their native region. And if you look at the two yellow ones, so the ones that are boxed in, one on the top, uh, second from the right, and then bottom, second from the left. Those are the two species that we have here, and they look very similar. Um, so again, it's really hard to tell the difference just by looking at them. We would have to do a DNA test to figure out which one was which. Uh, so here are their native regions. Um, so the green is for the... Sorry, the devil firefish. Um, and then the blue one is for the red lionfish. This star right here, uh, that is actually the Suez Canal. They actually think that they have entered the through the Suez Canal and they're now going to take over the Mediterranean. Um, that canal is a major uh, waterway for a lot, of or a lot of ships to get places. So that's how they think they got introduced into the Mediterranean. And then we are over here. Um, so North America, there's Florida. Uh, so the red is where their population has been established. This map is from, I believe it's 2017. So the hash marks going around the coast of South America is where they think they're going to start taking over. They already have been there. Um, so they'll probably start extending it a little bit further south. Um, maybe maybe all the way down. I don't know if they'll go all the way down. Uh, one of the things that uh, set lionfish apart is that they can kind of tolerate, like I said, all sorts of environments, but also temperatures as well. So if we were to go up in the Northeast, so water temperatures up near New York and Rhode Island, they're not very pleasant compared to here in Florida. Uh, it's pretty cold there. Like, especially right now, it's probably about 55 degrees, I would say. And in the summertime, it doesn't get much warmer than 75 if you're lucky. Um, so they can tolerate those cold temperatures. So as they move further South, 
it's uh, towards Argentina down here, um, there is a possibility that they can kind of take over that area as well. So here is this live animation. So if you check the top left, that actually is the year and watch the dots. So we have that first one in 1985 off of South Florida and watch as it expands. Dun, 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 dun. I'm having fun. So there's a huge explosion right in 2001 and now they're just gonna start taking over. So you can see how the, now they've entered the Gulf of Mexico. Here they are in Central America. And now they're starting to go down and around Brazil on the East Coast of South America. Um, I'll let it run through one more time in case you missed it. Uh, there is an updated map. It just wasn't as friendly um, on the slideshow. It didn't, it didn't do what I wanted it to do. Um, but I am trying to get one that has almost as close to 2020 data as I can. Uh, but this one just didn't, it didn't fit right with the slide. So... We're going only till 2013. Just know they're everywhere. They're taking over. Their population is not in check. Um, so one of the biggest problems with lionfish, why they have been so successful with invading the Atlantic Ocean, is because they're not from here. Uh, so they have no natural predators. So nothing knows to eat them because nothing in the Atlantic recognizes them as prey. Um, another thing is that they're active hunters. So they get their name lionfish, if you look at this photo right here. So they actually use those pectoral fins to herd their prey. So kind of like a lion's mane. Um, and they just kind of guide them to where they can then ambush them. Um, so they corner them and then you can see this mouth. That's the only limiting factor for what it can eat. So that's what we call a gate limiting factor. As long as their prey can fit into their mouth, they're gonna eat it. There have been documented cases of them swallowing something two thirds the size of their body. And another crazy fact about them is that their stomach can expand up to 30 times the size of normal. Uh, they In the Indo-Pacific, they are nocturnal, which means they are active at nighttime. They have found fish here in the Atlantic during the daytime. Um, so now they're thinking that since they've gotten to the Atlantic, they are starting to be diurnal as well. They're just opportunistic. Whenever they can eat, they're going to eat. Um, they are gluttonous. They will eat until they their stomach stretches 30 times the size. Um, they are one of the few species on Earth, other than humans really, who have fat deposits on them and actually can get fatty liver disease. Um, when we cut open our lionfish, we might be able to see it. Um, so we'll stay tuned for that. Um, so here is a lionfish that someone dissected and you can see they have 64 different species, or sorry, 64 different fish in their stomach uh, plus shrimp. So here are the shrimp. One, if you follow my mouse, two, three, four, and then look at all these fish. So like I said, they swallow their fish hole, their prey hole. Um, one of the things they eat anything. So they're having a huge impact here in Florida because they're eating those commercially important species that we have here. So they're going after parrotfish, they're going after hogfish, grouper, things like that. Parrotfish are really important because they uh, actually feed on algae. So they don't allow the algae to overgrow the coral. Um, so they trim that down. And then parrotfish actually poop out sand. So that beautiful white sand you see in tropical beaches, that's parrotfish poop. So they're really important for our islands and things like that. And just for reference, that permanent marker, just so you can see how big the lionfish are. Um, oh, the video's not going to work. Nope. Rats. That's right. So this video right here, it's really cool. It's by Smithsonian. So if you get some free time on YouTube, uh, just Google Smithsonian lionfish feeding. So basically, it just shows how um, some, some of them will hunt in packs or herds like lions and they all kind of corral their species using or their prey using those pectoral fins and kind of using one another to surround their prey and then their mouth see how wide it can shoot open they can actually shoot open that mouth and they'll grab their fish that way um videos has been a little tricky showing a video over zoom has been a little bit tricky for me so if you want the um website of this video, please email us meek at nova.edu or type it in the chat box and I can send it to you there. We also will probably post it on Facebook because technology. Woohoo! All right, moving right along. Um, another thing about them is their reproduction strategy. So most species have a certain time of the year that they reproduce. Um, usually the spring is really popular for a lot of animals, but these guys are actually able to reproduce year round. So that's one thing that sets them apart. They can always, uh, as long as the female is sexually mature, uh, they are able to reproduce all the time. And this is also something the females are sexually mature after one year. So after surviving for one year, she is then able to reproduce. So there's another factor. And this is like one of the craziest things to me. They, the female has anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 eggs every time she spawns. 
And she can spawn about every four days. So we'll do some fast math. That's about 2.74 million eggs per female per year. So their reproductive strategy is crazy. Um, they are in these like large larva, um, egg sacs that float uh, at the mercy of the current before they then settle. They can actually be in the water up to 35 days. They're still viable after 35 days. And nothing can really penetrate that egg sac. Nothing can really get to them. Um, it's really if they don't settle within the 35 days, then they're not viable. They're no longer able to produce the offspring. But for the most part, they're pretty good at reproducing. Uh, so if you look at the top right on this photo right here, this is what one of the egg masses look like. So it kind of looks like, I think it's eggs, pile of boogers. It's not, it's really gross. But anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 eggs per spawn. And like I said, they can do it every four days and they produce year round. Um, so that's another huge reason why they are um, so terrible here in Florida because nothing's keeping them in check. They have a voracious appetite. They will eat whatever they can uh, and they can reproduce like crazy. Um, so their growth. So here is um, a lionfish. So they don't get to be too, too large, about 18 inches or so is probably one of the largest ones we'll have here. Um, but they start off pretty small. So if you look here, that's just the guy's thumbnail. Um, so they start pretty tiny, then they can get pretty large. Um, so one of the things, oh, there we go. Uh, one of the things about them that kind of deter predators from going after them are those spines. So they have 18 venomous spines. So really quick, the difference between venom and poison. Venom is when you are injected, so like those spines, whereas poison is when you ingest it. So think of food poisoning. If you eat something not very, that's bad, your body doesn't like it. Whereas um, if you were injected by one of the spine or one of the, the venomous spines, sorry, um, then it would not end well. Well, you'd be fine. It would hurt for a little bit, but you'll be fine. Uh, so they have 13 of the uh, venomous spines on the dorsal or top fins. So dorsal refers to the top part of an animal. Ventral refers to the bottom part of the animal, in case you get confused. Um, anterior means closer to the head, and posterior means closer to the tail. So those 13 venomous spines on the dorsal fin. Then they also have two on the pelvic fin, so right down here. And then we have three on the anal fin. So we're right back there. Um, so they have, their spines are their defense mechanism. Um, if they can't, because like I said, they're very slow moving and conspicuous. Um, so they will try to hide, but if something were to go after them, they use the spines. Um, it's not very pleasant if you are stung by one. Uh, don't recommend it, but uh, it can cause redness, swelling, numbness, dizziness, or nausea. Um, soak it in hot water. And if it hurts for more than like 30 to 90 minutes, go to the hospital, they will help you. Uh, when we do our lionfish, all the spines are removed. Fun fact. Um, and this is what it looks like. So normally, so if we look at this photo here, um, we don't see that needle-like spine. We just see uh, the fin kind of covering the spine. When they're ready, to, if they feel threatened and they're going to sting someone, um, they actually pull, oh, I pointed to the screen, you can't see that. Uh, they will pull that flap of skin back or the scales back. And then that spine right here, that's where it injects. Their venom gland is going to be located down here. Right, moving right along. Oh, there we go, this one worked, awesome. So, uh, because they are not from here, they are not used to, um, they don't have any predator recognition, right? They don't know that anything's going after them. This was actually taken by, I believe it was FWC divers off the coast of Pensacola, so in the panhandle of Florida. So look at them, they're being picked off one by one, see as the diver places them into the bag and they are not reacting because they don't have predators here. They're not recognizing that they are in danger right now. They're just hanging out. Um, and this is, like I said, up in Pensacola. So they, they're just, they're taking over. They're not good for our environment here. All right, so a little depressing because like, what can we do? Um, but so some of the things we can do, researchers believe it's gonna be basically impossible to eradicate them from the area just because there are so many and the reproductive strategies and things like that. So what we can do is we can educate people about them. Uh, so just bringing awareness to them, uh, just saying, just showing you guys how destructive they are to the reefs and different things like that. Um, so that's why we are doing this, just to kind of teach everyone, especially here in Florida, just what uh, terrible, devastating things that lionfish can do to our ecosystem. Um, another thing that we do here are lionfish derbies. So we've been doing them for the past, I want to say 10 years. Uh, Reef, which is the Reef Environmental Education Foundation located down in the Keys. They are kind of the ones who really started it because they were seeing a huge problem out on the reefs down there. Uh, they have lionfish derbies, not only in the Keys, but throughout the states uh, because of everything that's going on right now. A lot of them have been canceled. Uh, there is currently one listed for July 14th and 15th in Fort Lauderdale. Um, so if you are local, 
definitely stay up to date with our website in case it does get canceled. Uh, but basically it's either a day or a weekend full of a competition. So you get to form teams, you can snorkel, you can free dive, you could scuba. You basically go out and try to catch as many as you can. There are prizes. So there's some for having the most fish, some for having the biggest, some for having the smallest, some for having uh, like females or pregnant females, something like that. Um, so if you can go to those, it's also super fun. Uh, I, I'm not a fish person. Uh, I don't uh, enjoy eating fish, but I have had them and I, it was very delicious. So eat them if you can. A lot of the local restaurants have put them on their menus. I know Publix was selling them for a while. Whole Foods was selling them for a while. So definitely check it out if you can. Um, and another thing, so citizen science. So I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but citizen science is basically when non-scientists, everyday people collect data, usually observations. Um, birding is a big one. Uh, but for here, uh, the FWC wants you guys, if you're out diving, if you see lionfish, make a note of it. Um, so send it into them where you are, how many you saw, things like that. Um, and then that way we can kind of track their population as well. So there is hope. Um, but again, it's just getting the information out there, kind of bringing awareness to what's going on. All right. So now we are going to switch gears and get to the fun part of the dissection. I'm going to stop that. You're probably going to see my face. which doesn't. Oh, and we, if you have any questions, please type them. Hi, Colton. All right. Wow, first try. That never works. All right, so we're going to do a dissection today. Um, and again, any questions, go ahead, drop it in the comments. I will get to them, I promise. My favorite color is blue. Obviously, if I had a superpower, I'd be a shapeshifter. That's really about it. I want to fly. <clears throat> There we go. It was set up so nice for the other one. All right. So um, how we get our lionfish, we actually had a connection with uh, the Biscayne National Park. Uh, so they would do these beach cleanups and um, we would kind of help them and they'd give us some lionfish. We also do community service hours. So as a um, public uh, for the Florida State Public Schools, you have to do a certain amount of community service hours in high school. Uh, and for a while, we and we still are doing it now, um, just with everything going on, uh, we would give high schoolers or whoever community service hours um, for giving us lionfish. So if you are interested in that, please shoot us a message and because we could always use them because um, we use them a lot. We it's one of our big programs here because who doesn't love dissecting? Um, and then we, of course, we take off all the spines and all that good stuff. So this one was donated to us from a community service hours. So here is our lionfish. Oh uh, yeah. So one of the first things we do as scientists, we make observations. So we're just checking them out. So this is what the lionfish looks like. And remember those uh, dorsal spines, we did take them off. So the venomous spines, they'd be all right here. Uh, we do have their pectoral fins. So this is what gives them their name. They can open it up nice and wide. Oh, oh there we go. Um, and this is what they use to kind of herd those their prey and then they'll catch them. Um, so it does look like a lion's mane, I think, um, but very cool. We also have the head. They do have uh, like modified spines along their face right here. So if you touch it, it's like really aggressive sandpaper. Um, so when you are handling them, please be careful. Um, they do have spines up here as well. And then they do have some spines down here. We do, um, we use these spines actually, and we actually have a lionfish jewelry making uh, class if you guys ever want to check it out. Um, it's really fun. Then you get to walk away with a cool necklace. So it's a win-win. Um, so just going over, <laughs> thank you. Um, the uh, to orient yourself with the fish the top side is going to be the dorsal side bottom side is going to be the ventral side closer to the head is going to be anterior closer to the tail is going to be posterior and i see a question from anaya saying are there organizations that don't want them killed um over here in the atlantic ocean no um just because they are invasive they are such a problem for us here uh, we want we don't want them here because they cause such problems to our reef. So over in the Atlantic Ocean, we we do want to get rid of them. Uh, over in the Indo-Pacific, since they are native there, um, they probably want to keep them there. They do have uh, predators over there keeping them in check as well. Um, on a side note really quick, one thing that we tried to do in the Atlantic Ocean was kind of teach animals, other big predators, to eat these guys. So for a while, they were... Um, spear fishing the lionfish and feeding them to groupers, feeding them to sharks, right? So then they learned, the sharks and the groupers learned, okay, well, we don't have to be afraid of these and now we're going to eat. However, sharks don't know 
the difference between scientists who are teaching them how to eat off of a spear gun versus someone who's just out for fun spear gun, right? So that caused a lot of issues. So a shark would then associate a spear gun with snacks and who doesn't love snacks, right? So that in, that could potentially increase the shark and human interaction. Um, so they decided to get away with that method because it just was going to cause more problems than what it was worth. Um, so whenever you begin a dissection, so we have our dissection tray. We have our scissors right here. And I'll be using those. And then we have our forceps because we are doing science today. They do look like tweezers, but forceps are for science and tweezers are for eyebrows. So maybe later we'll be doing that. Um, when you are cutting, you want to cut away from yourself. So I always like to orient the animal where I'm cutting up. So I, well, the best way, so you want, it's a little flipped for you guys because cameras and technology, um, but the head is on my left side and then the tail is on my right side. So anterior on my left, posterior on my right, and then I am looking for, there is a hole right underneath here. So I'm gonna lift it up with the forceps. Oh, I've been accepting as we go. Oh, oh, sorry, Cal, jealous. Um, so I'm gonna lift up the forceps because I don't wanna cut any of the internal organs. So I get to lift the skin away and then I'm gonna snip all the way up uh, basically to the gill raker and then I'm gonna cut along behind the pectoral fin up to the top because I wanna get as much exposure to the internal cavity as I can. Oh, he's squishy. <laughs> we need some background music. Oh, and the flies are swarming. They're like, oh, lunch. That's okay. They're like, that girl's smelly. All right, and then I'm gonna cut up along behind the pectoral fin. And I'm gonna try and cut as far up to the dorsal fin as I can without getting attacked by these flies. And it gets a little tougher through here. I'm gonna Hold it. We're won't be like. You see no. Who's ever unmuted? I think it's Colton. If you could just mute your microphone, please, sir. Or ma'am. Oh, never mind. Took care of it. If you guys have any questions besides eating the coral cleaners, how are they damaging to the ecosystem? Um, great question. So they eat a lot of the commercially important species here. So here in Florida, we um, because we are surrounded by water on three sides, we are. We catch a lot of our food from there. Um, so if they're eating the commercially important species like our grouper and our hogfish, we also have a lot of people come in for fishing. So uh, sport fishing is really big down here as well. So if they are taking away the fish that people are going after, why are people going to come to Florida, right? Um, so not just the parrot fish, which are the coral cleaners. I like that nickname though. Uh, but they'll also go after, like I said, those groupers, the hogfish, things that we eat, and then things that bring people down here for sport fishing. Um, so they are, they just eat too much. That's really what it comes down to. They're too gluttonous. All right. So now, all right, so now we have our insides nice and cut open for us. Should have this. Actually, get out. That's okay. We're gonna wing it. No, nah, we're gonna wing it. Um, so if you look here, I'm gonna pull this out a little bit. So remember how I said they are gluttonous eaters. Their stomach can expand about thirty times the size, um, and they are one of the few species on Earth that can actually have fat deposits, and they can actually get fatty liver disease. Humans are one of the other ones as well. Um, this right here is a whole bunch of fat. So I'm just gonna pull that off. Um, one thing that we can do uh, if we had a school group here, um, we can actually measure the volume of fat. And the way we would do that is with displacement. So we would take a graduated cylinder, we would fill it up to let's say 30 milliliters, and then we would drop the fatty deposits in there. And then the amount that the water moved up on the graduated cylinder, that would give us a volume. Uh, so this guy's pretty fatty. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get all this off. Ooh. In New York, I'm at least. Oh, yeah. Gross. Where's Elliot's music when you need it? <laughs> and one of the first things we're going to do is actually we're going to cut out the stomach. Oh, I think he's got something in there. Oh, yeah. All right. So what I like to do when I cut out the stomach... So you can actually see, well, it's a little bit hard here, um, but all the way up, you got to work with me, man. 
all the way up back here. Up in here is actually where the esophagus connects to the mouth. Um, so remember, they don't, oh my gosh, so much fat. Oh my God. Uh, so they don't chew their food. They do swallow it whole. Um, they do have teeth. So let me show you that. So remember, they are gape limited predators. So look at their mouth normally, right? Not that impressive. You're like, okay, I'm not that scared. But remember, they can open it really large. So look how wide I can open that. Look how large that mouth opens. So anything that can fit in their mouth, they're gonna eat. They do have teeth. Um, so if you kind of feel, well, you can't, but I'll tell you, if you feel right here, it feels like sandpaper. Um, if you ever were to hold a lionfish, I recommend holding it here because there are no spines on the underside. There are spines here. Um, not venomous, but they do. They're prickly. They don't feel pleasant. So this is actually the best way to hold it. And again, you could just kind of see that how wide that gape is, how large they can do. Um, we like to measure the length and the width of it just to kind of compare when we have groups here, just to a, do a little bit more science, but B, compare how large they are. And I don't know if the lighting is going to help, but you can actually see the, the tongue right here and then the gill rakers back in the mouth. A little bit hard to see, but we'll cut that open in a moment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cut the esophagus as close to the mouth as I can. And then we're going to pull the stomach out and check out and see what they're eating. What do they have in there? Do they have anything? Do you guys have any guesses of what's going to happen? You can type it in the comments. I might read them. Yeah, I don't know if it's me up there, so it's not. <laughs> Did you miss this? In there. He just has so much fat. Oops. Disgusting. I think I'm just going to struggle. I think the tiny fish. Ah, oh, good guess, Elizabeth. Tiny fish? I think you're right. Just give me one second. Oh, we're getting in there today. And there are some connective tissues as well. So I'm kind of cutting through that and cutting through the esophagus. That esophagus is really, it's a strong muscle. Uh, so cutting through it with my little dainty pair of scissors sometimes doesn't work for me. Oh, here we go. Let me just cut that. Can you eat my fish? Can you eat lionfish? Yes, you can. Who asked? I did. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You could definitely eat lionfish. Um, you can go out and catch it yourself if you want. Or like if you're in Florida, a lot of restaurants are starting to sell it just because they are an invasive species and they are a delicious fish. Um, I had said this before, I don't eat fish, but this was one fish that I did make a... Uh, what is that called? Ceviche. Thank you. Ceviche. No, no, I, exception. That's the word I wanted. <laughs> Quarantine brain, guys. Not doing great. What about the venom glands? Does that affect how you eat it? Oh, the venom glands. Yes. You obviously want to make sure that you cut those off because you don't want to eat that. Um, and there, I know they have a bunch of YouTube videos on how to clean lionfish properly. But yeah. So here is where the esophagus connected. So right there. Um, and then this is its stomach right down here. This big blob, we're gonna go ahead and cut that open, see what we find. Oh, I accidentally got his heart as well, right there. And I'll pull that up in a moment. Sorry about that. Do lionfish eat other lionfish? Ooh, uh, yeah, baby, yeah. Lionfish will eat other lionfish. Um, they don't discriminate, they like to eat all the snacks. Oh, who said we had a small fish in here? I think it was Elizabeth. That's not a small yet. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, well, he's starting to break down a little bit. All right. So that came right out of its stomach. So that is a full fish. You guys can see I have a little bit of shaky hands. Sorry. Um, so here is one full fish in its stomach. So Elizabeth, I think it was you. Good job. Officially. Uh, <laughs> officially dead. <laughs> Anaya, you're hired whenever you want to start. Uh, we also have some shrimp. You guys check it out there. We got some shrimp in here too. What else? Um, a lot of stuff is starting to break down. So in the stomach is uh, acid. Ooh, what are you? What do you think? 
Some little fish bones. Tiny fish. And I'll zoom it. Oh yeah, that's the. <laughs> that's so cool. Like a fish spine. Oh my gosh. I'll frame it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. This guy had a lot right before he died. Ah! Wow. I think this might be the best one I've ever dissected. Usually they only have one or two fish. Yeah. If that. Normally it's just the goo. And by goo, I mean the digestive enzymes already breaking down. <laughs> Anything else? Wow. That was, that's a good, take a photo of that. Save that for later. Oh, here's another one. More fish bones. Yeah, it actually looks like a cat claw. Bubby? All right. So that was awesome. I haven't found a fish that big in this in a lionfish before, so that was super exciting for me. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Let's see. All right. So if you look, here was that one large fish we had. Or he had. I didn't have it. He ate it. Uh, then we had a shrimp right here. And then we had a couple of small fish and one more small shrimp. Here was just that fish skeleton with just the bones, which was pretty cool. Good job. I shouldn't congratulate him on eating, <laughs> but that was cool. Yeah. We'll have, no, we'll just disinfect this later. Yeah. <laughs> Fish cats. Mm -hmm. Reef.org has a list of restaurants. Oh, very cool. Um, Elizabeth said Reef.org has a list of restaurants that serve lionfish. Um, definitely check that out. Uh, Reef is a fantastic organization. Like I said, they're the ones who kind of started the lionfish derbies here. Um, so yes, definitely check it out. They are delicious. So oh, I popped it. Bummer. Uh, so how do fish kind of control where they're at in the water column. The way they do that, they have this uh, organ called the swim bladder. So it's basically, I could, I'll compare it to a balloon. Um, so they fill it with air when they want to go higher up in the water column, and then they can actually deflate it if they want to go deeper. Uh, so if you look right up there, this white part. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, I severed it. Already, I got too excited cutting the esophagus. So this was inflated, and then when I cut it, it deflated. And this will run down basically the entire length of the fish. Um, and they have a muscle right on top of it that controls, that can contract uh, or relax. Uh, how do you know if the lionfish is a boy or a girl? Oh, good question, Julie. Um, they're, uh, they're reproductive organs, which I think I might have pulled out accidentally when I cut open that stomach. This is intestines. That's not it. So this is the remnants of the intestines that I didn't destroy when I was cutting. I'm just going to move that off to the side. Oh, I think it's a male. Yeah, I think that's a chesky. Yep. So if you look right here, oh, so easy when they do it, right? Um, no, I just made it disappear. Sorry about that. It's a big guy. Yeah, I know. So note to self, always get big fish. Uh, what I'm holding right here, it's like a white stringy thing. Kind of looks like a booger, if you ask me. Um, that is a testy, so we know it's a male. Uh, we always have, oh, I pulled it out. There we go. Awesome. What does it matter at this point? Uh, so that right there is going to be a testy. So we have a male. What do the females look like? I believe the females are a gelatinous yellow off-whitish color. Or no, yellowish. Yeah, yellowish clearish color. Yeah. Um, kind of looks like jelly. And it sometimes have, yeah, egg. like an oval shape, egg shape. Um, and it sometimes has little specks in them, and that is actually the eggs. We did have one lionfish uh, about, gosh, time two months ago, yeah. February, um, in February, where we actually had a pregnant female. So it was really cool. We were able to take out the egg sac, and then we popped it underneath the microscope, and then you could get a close-in look on all of the uh, eggs, which was super fun to find. All right. So here's the rest of that swim bladder. Did I miss anything else? Okay. It looks gooey. <laughs> it is gooey, Camilla. <laughs> it's real gooey. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to remove this. One last thing I'm going to do. I'm going to, well, I might do two things. It's 141, so we technically only have like five more minutes, but 
So here is still that swim bladder. So it goes pretty long. Um, so we're going to check out the gills really quick. So fish are, they breathe oxygen just like us, but they have gills. So we have lungs, they have gills. So as the water flows over their gills, they're able to extract it or extract the oxygen. I'm going to go ahead and cut one of these out so we can get a nice close look at it. And then eyeball. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does anybody know how to tell how old a fish is? Would the eggs still be able to hatch after you dissect the fish? Ooh, um, to my knowledge, no. Uh, I also don't know if the eggs were fertilized. Um, she just had the eggs inside of her, so chances are they don't become fertilized until it's the egg sac when it's out and free floating. Um, let me scroll. Uh, do you mind just scrolling up a inch? I missed one before Sloan's. All right. Uh, how many babies can they have at a time? Ooh, Alexis, good question. So there, one egg sac can have anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 eggs at a time, and they can reproduce every four days. Fast math, that's about 2.74 million eggs per female per year. When do they reach sexual maturity? They reach sexual maturity at one years old. How long do they live? They, hmm, on average, I think it's about 12 years in the yeah. wild. They don't, they live long, but not too long. Um, so that right there is one of the gills. Bum, bum, bum. Wow. Oh, I like the excitement, Julie. Uh, how do you know? Ooh, is that how? Oh, the gill. Oh, Anaya, I see what you're saying. You think the gills is how we tell how old it is? No, you just ask them. <laughs> just kidding. You can't ask them. They won't tell you, especially ladies. They won't reveal their age. Uh, but fish, we actually, it's called an otolith or their ear bone. Um, so if we were to go, it's a little bit hard to find in these guys because they're tiny. But if we were to go right in the head area right here, they do have an internal ear um, like us. <laughs> that was a laugh. Um, they do have an internal ear. <laughs> so what they do, um, similar to how trees, they have, you know how trees have rings on them and then we can guess the age. Very similar to these guys. So they really will have about two new layers added every year. Um, one of them is going to be in like the spring and summertime where a lot of growth happens really quickly. And then a smaller uh, layer will be deposited in the fall or winter. Um, so it's about every two. So there'll be about two new layers added every year. And you can actually figure it out like that. Um, like I said, these guys are a little bit too small. It gets a little messy trying to find their otoliths. Um, so I'm going to skip on that. Maybe I'll do it after we're done recording and then show it on the Internet. Maybe. Um, my last favorite thing to do is to take out the eyeball. Um, they actually have a membrane covering the eye. How long have I been doing this? Way too long. Um, I've been in marine, si uh, marine education for the last five years. Um, yeah, I know. I was like, time. Uh, so, But lionfish, this dissection is actually new to me. I've only been doing it since I've been at the Meek, and I've been here for about eight months time um so not too long but i've done squid dissections like that um if we which we will be having a cephalopod one uh coming up soon check that out that i could do in my sleep because i've done probably about 10 billion of those not really i'm gonna say a couple thousand though um so one of the things that i like to do is so comparing eyeballs so we live on land right so our eyes are in constant contact with air whereas our fish live in the water so the lens which is in the eyeball do you think our lenses are going to look the same or do you think they're going to look different? Oh, Brendan dissected this point. Camilla, I do not know how old this fish is. Um, if I were to take out the otolith or the ear bone, I'd be able to figure it out. But it gets, it, since this guy is so small, it's sometimes hard to find and it just gets messy. Um, but as for our lens, so humans, we have a lens in our eyeball and it's actually shaped like a crescent moon or a quarter moon or kind of like a contact lens if you're looking at it from the side um, because we live in the air. Fish lenses and a lot of our aquatic animals they actually have circular lenses. Um, so it looks like a little bead, if you guys can see it on my finger there. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and the reason for that, they live in the water, right? So if they open their eyes underwater, they can see really well. If we were to go in the ocean and open our eyes, everything is super blurry to us. But the way that we've kind of adapted is that we'll put a pocket, over, a pocket of air over our eyes, uh, goggles or a mask, and then we can see clearly. Um, so it's really cool. I love taking them out. Um, it's, it's just a cool, little way to see the difference between us and our ocean creatures. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and type them in the comments. Um, I'm just going to be wrap. Oh, we done. Uh, I guess we hit 40 minutes. Oh, we are at our max, guys. If you could still hear me. Or did the chat just close? Oh, no. Oh, no, it's done. What is that? Oh, no, we're back. 
but they get updated. Oh, that was strange. All right. So if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and shoot them in the comments. Um, you, if you guys, whenever we're open again, we are open to the public. We do uh, daily feedings of our resident green sea turtle. That's kind of our bread and butter here. Um, so Captain, she was hit by a boat. She's non-releasable. So we kind of talk about her. We go about uh, her history, her injuries, and then we go into general sea turtle ecology on Saturday. Oh, yeah. Uh, biology and all that good stuff. If you guys are bored this Saturday at 1 p.m. on our Facebook page, we are doing a Captain live stream. So we'll, again, we'll be talking about her. We'll be feeding her, her history, her injuries, all that good stuff. Uh, we also have public programs called Science Saturday. We offer it twice a month. Um, and each time it's a one hour session right at one o'clock. We love 1 p.m. Uh, but it's a hands-on uh, activity for the kids to do. So we usually have a little bit of a discussion portion. We've done the lionfish program before. We do cephalopods, we do plankton, freshwater, all that good stuff, marine mammals. Um, but it's just to get you guys exposure, get experience, because a lot of times kids don't get to do dissections until high school, maybe, if not college. Um, so we want to kind of expose everyone to how cool the ocean is, because there are a lot of people who live in Florida that have no idea what's going on in the ocean. And we need to educate people people because once you know about something and you and you want to save it you care then you start making changes so thank you guys for hanging out and i am sorry this was fun and disgusting but i'm counting that as a win um we are recording this so it will be posted to our facebook page and our youtube channel um so look marine environmental education center and if you guys want to check out any other videos or see what we're up to check it out we hope everyone's staying safe and we can't wait to see you guys hopefully soon Thank you. Thank you. You guys rock. Thanks for stepping in. Woohoo! And you guys have a wonderful day.